risk scoring. Um, and I think uh, this is a very important topic and a very basic topic. And I hope uh, you will enjoy this uh, session. Uh, so if you start talking about risk scoring, there are so many risk scoring uh, uh, charts that are available for different uh, um, um, diseases in the body. And uh, so how do we make it practical? And I think that is the most important question. So within this next 15, 20 minutes, we'll try to see whether we can implement this risk scoring charts into our practice. And uh, I think I'm having some problem. Uh, Ma'am, just click on your screen once and then try changing it. Thank you. Thank you for that help. Yeah. So uh, I have no disclaimers. And uh, like uh, my previous speaker said, that nature guides best when guided. And we should be only resorting to medication when absolutely necessary and, in, and on indication. So what actually is a risk? A risk is the chance that any activity, any activity or action could really happen or that would harm you. So this is what is risk. And risk is there everywhere in your life. Any, any, any step that you do, you know, whether you're walking on the road or any, any activity would involve some amount of risk, but we would like to take that risk to, to achieve something. So similarly, living itself is a risk. So risk score is a calculated number. Actually, that is what the, this risk scoring systems are charts do. And this is a process of retaining a calculated scores, which collectively tells you which are based on several factors. So then a scoring system comes in. And now these risk scoring charts could be a qualitative or it could be quantitative. So when it is a qualitative risk assessment, they're generally based on certain factors and they're more subjective. But whereas the quantitative risk assessment are actually on values that have been devised and then over statistical distributions based on the risk of probability and the impact inputs, and then they give you more meaningful uh, assessments and probably they fare better. Then, but do we need these risk scores and why do we need them? When you start uh, practicing in your uh, clinic and you are with the patient, imagine when you're writing down the number of risks that a particular woman would have, say for a CVD, for breast, for Alzheimer's, there's, there wouldn't be an end. And they, it, you would be landed up in a maze and you would really un not understand where to place this woman. So risk scoring is a very important tool, especially in menopausal women. Not only in menopausal women, I think everywhere, even in obstetrics, we are now moving more and more into the risk sorting assessment, especially in the first trimester, be uh, aware, you know, there is this um, inversion of the pyramid. So, and it is very, very important because it is simple to calculate. All you need to do is a uh, paper and a pen, or you have the gadgets where you go into the um, application and then you can uh, generate, you enter the data and, and, and it tells you where this woman stands for her assessment for any particular disease. So it's very, very simple to calculate. And it is easier to interpret in terms of the clinical implication. And then very, very important, it, it gives you a lead for an action. So it is actionable. So they're designed around a set of possible actions that should be taken as a result of the calculated score. So this is, uh, this is what is risk assessment score and why we should be doing it. So especially in medicine, these models actually estimate the risks of the initial disease in apparently healthy asymptomatic individuals based on assessment of multiple variables. So obstetricians, I'm sure, are well-versed with these models by, by now. And all of these risk models, they have their advantages, they have their disadvantages, and they have the limitations. It's very, very important that the person who is using this risk model of any disease understands the limitations, understands the advantages, understands the disadvantages, and how appropriate is for that particular woman of that particular population and where you're, being, where you're using this risk model, whether that has been particularly validated in the population that you're using. And so no single risk model is appropriate for all patients. So coming to a screening test. So when you say risk model assessment and a screening test, so these are the scoring that you're doing. But then when you're applying a screening test, then you are actually uh, classifying these women into a very high risk or a moderate risk or a low risk for a condition. And then you take it further after that as to how you're going to use this information for the benefit of the woman, for counseling the woman, or for managing the woman in terms of medical treatment. 
So these are the guidelines which have been uh, <clears throat> uh, issued from the coming, uh, have come from the Indian Menopause Society right from the time Urvashi came out with this um, about 20 to 30 pages booklet. The first one, the first national consensus on HRT. Those days it was called HRT. Now it is MHT to 2020. Now this book runs almost like 500 to 600 pages. And I think one of the most important uh, 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 new things that we have added in the book from the IMS is the clinical eva evaluation and the risk assessment score. So when you see a woman at menopause, you immediately think about which stage she is in, whether she is premenopausal, perimenopausal, or postmenopausal. So once you decide the stage of menopause, and here I think we should be promoting the modified Ankele Sharia's Indian Menopause Society group of staging, because then it just gives you a clue as to which phase of life this particular woman is there and then you kind of <clears throat> plan the treatment for her and planning of treatment becomes very very important because these are all long-term issues it's not that it's not just one-time contact you're going to see this woman every year probably or maybe more often if there is a problem so once you stage the disease then in your mind you're going to think about this woman where, and uh, from the history you're going to know whether she is symptomatic or whether she is asymptomatic and anyway the preventive health becomes important it both the ways. And something that is very, very important is risk assessment for disease, whether she's a symptomatic woman or whether she's an asymptomatic woman. And that's how we're going to take it forward. And of course, finally, you group these women into two major groups, one is with menopausal symptoms and without menopausal symptoms. But now today, the topic uh, uh, today is the risk score and then in CVD. In CVD, when you start looking at the number of risk scores that we have, there are so many which are modifiable, so many which are non-modifiable, and these are the additional risk factors for stroke. So how are you going to put all this in your practice? You cannot remember all of them, and you cannot start asking each and every one, and how are you going to put it uh, in, in a format which is going to be meaningful? So that is why these scoring charts have come in. There are so many of them, and most of them, they are they are this framing, Framingham is from the US and then you have the JBS uh, um, and the Interheart. This is from uh, UK. The China is from the China. But then this is the one that WHO ISH risk prediction chart, which have been actually um, developed for the uh, Asian countries and the low. The, but then they also have, uh, they cover all the countries, but then it has been validated in some studies for our Indian population. So having said that, like we said, every every uh, assessment prediction tools have their advantages and disadvantages. And uh, these are the factors which have been looked into in all these different risk assessment tools which are there all over the world. So there was, uh, uh, but we have, from the Indian Menopause Society, we have adopted this World Health Organization ISA charts for the simple reason that this actually predicts a 10-year risk of combined myocardial infarction and stroke risk, fatal and non-fatal. And this has been developed from the best available mortality and risk factor data. So it is actually a statistical analysis what they have done, especially in the low and middle income countries. And they've come out with this very simple model. And this is a very simple model, which can be actually done not only by, your, by the doctor, by the clinician, but by any paramedical staff or even by the woman herself, if she knows how to do that. So these charts are very, very useful for start stratifying the risk for people whose blood pressure is less than 160, 100. So if a woman has more than 160, 100, automatically she falls off into a high risk category for CVD. So there's no, no, no meaning of a prediction chart. So these prediction charts are specially devised to actually pick up normal women, healthy women for hypertension, for uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. So if somebody is already suffering from uh, high blood pressure or a cholesterol, which is more than 145 milligrams per decaliter or even an uncomplicated diabetes, then you really Really don't need so that means she's already a high risk category for cardiovascular disease you don't need to do this risk prediction chart so once the, uh, these are ruled out and also there are some limitations like i'm going to come to it next so then once you do this risk assessment you classify this woman as high medium or low risk over a period of 10 years. So these risk assessment modules give you a risk whether this woman would have a cardiovascular event, fatal or not non-fatal in the next coming 10 years. So this was actually done in 2007. And um, the uh, and uh, this is based on, but then the, it is, the charts are very different
important for china say for uh, um, for the asian population for indian population simply because there is a difference in the way of living the geographical variation the risk factors the age everything differs so we know that we as indians age faster the cardiovascular events occur much earlier 10 years earlier the osteoporosis occurs 10 years earlier so you cannot be using the prediction models which are based on age from other countries so you have to have prediction models which are uh, specific to india because our risk factors are different from the other countries so the major limitation of these charts is the absence of the population derived epidemiological data which is generally used in most of the um, prediction charts so it is statistically based based on the mortality and then they have developed these charts so these charts also remember they do not include the very high risk factors such as obesity family history of uh, premature uh, cvd the poi and uh, even microalbuminuria and uh, high crp so if any of these factors are also present probably it's more prudent to go and do the grbs or the framingham score or the score which is available so these are the other lengthy ones which we do or very very simply uh, what the what the um, cardiologists generally do are go for the non invasive tests that is the cst score or the simple uh, ultrasound based cimt so th those two also actually figure pretty well when you don't want to go through these scoring systems and when you think that this particular woman is already at a high risk for uh, um, cardiovascular disease so there was a very nice study which was published uh, in a book called preventive um, uh, cardiology and there are about four studies where they have done different types they have used different types of risk evaluations and what they have found that the jbs risk evaluation actually scores the best and the the whi ish Uh, really uh, may miss uh, um, uh, may miss a lot of women because obesity is not included the you know, premature poi is not included the family history is not included but having said that the jbs is very very lengthy so for uh, um, so it, you know then you have to again understand the risk benefit analysis and see what really works for us and what is simple to use and what is more implementable it's not that you have this risk prediction uh, tools um, uh, you know you 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 could create something and which is there in the books and which is not been used by the clinicians then it really doesn't matter so having some tool which can be used by the clinician would make more sense even if you are going to miss out a few uh, um, uh, even if it is not very um, sensitive but if it is specific i think that's much more important so this is the tool the whi is a tool say supposing a woman is um, and this is based on the age this is based on the gender this is based on the use of tobacco this is based on and the uh, systolic blood pressure and the cholesterol so these are the factors in which this risk assessment tool is based so like i said the obesity is not there the family history is not there so any of those factors are there then you have to uh, um, be a little more careful so um, say supposing this woman is 44 years old and she, her blood pressure is 110 by 70 and her cholesterol is 310 so once you plot this uh, woman's uh, as a risk she falls somewhere around this so that means she is 10 to 30% and it's also divided as uh, the green ones give you less than 10% and the orange gives you the 10, 20 to 30% and more than uh, if she falls in this red area of the graph then she fall, then she is more than 40% that is high risk for um, uh, cardiovascular disease so this is how you are going to make so it's very very simple so you just have these five six uh, parameters and also there is a model where you don't have the cholesterol so in some rural areas where uh, <clears throat> even a lipid profile is not done so even without having a lipid bit profile just based on the blood pressure the gender the tobacco use and the age these factors itself can give you a rough idea about where the risk assessment would be and again you can assess the baseline risk for vte which i'll be again talking about so for it menopause it's very important the cardiovascular assessment is very very important not only for the management here was an in interesting study from chennai where they have used this uh, cardiac risk uh, assessment calculator uh, by the pharmacist and what they found is by using this calculator and assessing the cardiovascular risk for the next 10 years and just suggesting and picking up those hypertensive women those women who are at high risk and counseling them about the lifestyle counseling them about uh, actually brought out a tremendous difference in the management of hypertension so that means these simple tools have a, a huge implication in terms of uh, 
you know, managing these lifestyle disorders. So uh, when you're talking about the use of MHT, then again, <clears throat> We say that MHT should not be given if a woman is has an established CHD. So that's very, very simple. So you know she's on medication, she's got these problems, you're not going to give MHT. But how do you know whether she's mild or moderate or high risk? Because when it is high risk, then you say avoid MHT. And when you say she's at a moderate risk, go for transdermal. Low risk for CVD, safe and safe for use. But then how do you do it if you're not doing the risk assessment? So having a simple tool at hand gives you a very good idea as to give the MHT, not to give, and how to give it. So that's very, very important. So having said that, it's also important to assess the risk for VTE, especially when you're offering MHT. So the high risk group, you just have to go by the history, any recurrent uh, VT, spontaneous or with pregnancy or OC OCP use, family history, smokers, inherited thrombophilia, then you avoid MHT. So uh, here you're not even, you just have to do a few simple questions. You don't even have to go for any lengthy investigations. So in case of varicose veins, uh, of course, you can use the transdermal. And we know obesity is very, very important in uh, history taking because uh, obesity itself can uh, double the ratio, odds ratio of getting a VTE. Risk of stroke also we found that in MHD doesn't really matter. Now risk factors, I just brought up, brought on this diabetes mellitus because it's an important risk factor for uh, 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 for your for the for cardiovascular events and uh, it's it's like uh, uh, India is the leading capital but we know that again we again have to look into the modifiable factors and non-modifiable factors and go into this complete history and once you've taken this history the simplest thing that can you can do for assessment of this disease is a fasting blood sugar or an HB1AC though the GTT probably would fare better as a screening tool, but then these are more implementable. That means just doing an HB1AC, a fasting blood sugar, you can probably pick up many more people uh, whenever you find that you have a, a woman who is probably at a high risk for diabetes mellitus. So having said that, now we move on to the risk score in osteoporosis. In osteoporosis, what is the rationale? Why should we be doing for osteoporosis? Because more than we know that one in three women have uh, the chances of uh, osteoporosis and a fracture as one ages, and they occur 10 years earlier in women. And this is um, what, uh, what it is. It's not just about bone, but it is also about the muscle. So the bone health and muscle health both are equally important. And earlier on, it is a police fracture and as the age advances it is a hip fracture and there are no symptoms so we need to have some scoring system we need to have some indications as to which woman probably would be lining up with a problem at the age of 60 65 for us the fractures occur 10 years earlier so we start seeing fractures right from the age of 40 we have those uh, fractures of the radius and then the vertebral fractures between the 50s and 60s and, and the femurs between 50s and 70s <clears throat> So there are many indices that we can do. And uh, uh, so all the asymptomatic women about the age of 50, 40, the screening needs to be used. And uh, the risk factors for uh, uh, osteoporosis is different, whereas the risk factors for fractures are different. We need to understand. So putting all of them together is what these tools do. There are various tools available, but the FRAX is the commonest one, which is based on all these factors. We know the greater number of clinical risk factors that are present, the greater chances of a fracture. So they have pulled it all together, and the WHO assessment of absolute fracture risk is the FRAX. But the FRAX model actually doesn't really work too well in the Indian situation because the intervention thresholds, we don't have enough mortality data to understand when to intervene. Having said that, we know that if a woman, this is how you know you get you can go into the frax tool and then come out with the uh, with the um, assessment for a woman and this is what it appears major osteoporotic fractures with a bmd 22 hip fracture 9.2 so that means she's in a high risk so this is what you calculate and uh, so the benefits, of course, the cost utility and all that, but the limitation, especially in India, is because we don't have the interventional thresholds, it is very, very difficult to say which woman you're going to put her on treatment. So again, here, if a woman is suffering from osteoporosis, you're not going to do, use any prediction tool. You're going to use it only in cases of low bone mass, where you're going to predict, or in a normal woman, normal woman or an oste osteopenic woman, which woman is going to go for. So the simpler tool in India, which we are, really promoting is the OSTA, which is a very, very simple tool using the formula 
body weight minus age into my uh, into point two. And uh, this is what the chart looks like. Either you go by the formula, the two ways of doing it, or this is a very simple chart where you plot the age against the weight, and then you divide them into three. Now you see again here it is divided into low, medium, and high. But the best part of this tool is if a woman falls into low risk, that means out of hundred women who are diagnosed as having low risk only 3% probably would have osteoporosis. That means you're really picking up 97% of the women you're confident don't need the BMD. Whereas if it is high risk, 60% of them would probably have uh, um, osteoporosis and it's 40% you may be missing. So that means in high risk, all of them need to go for the BMD. Even in moderate, they need to go for the BMD. So that means this, this is an assessment, a screening tool before you actually subject them to, uh, to something which is more difficult to do. And we know that bone mineral density becomes very important. All postmenopausal women, more than five years of menopause need DEXA. So the indications for DEXA in India are very different from the NOF and the IOF. Postmenopausal women, less than five years of menopause with risk factors go for DEXA. Women in menopause transition with secondary causes, radiological evidence of uh, fractures, of course, go for DEXA. But apart from that, I think DEXA is very, very important, not only for the bone, but for obesity, but for uh, sarcopenia, and for assessing the mortality and the resting energy expenditure. So we have a lot in DEXA that can be done. And sarcopenia, we should not be forgetting, a simple five questions can be asked, and that gives you an indication whether no sarcopenia later. Uh, that is the case finding strategy. And if you find anything positive in the five questions that you're asking that whether she's able to walk, she's able to get up from her, this thing, whether she's able to climb the stairs, simple questions like that, then you make her undergo. If anything is positive, you make her assess by doing the muscle strength. And later on, of course, you need to do the other test if you find it. And then once you grade these uh, diseases, you simply put it in this tabular column, the breast assessment over the five or 10 years, the WHO cardiovascular risk assessment, the OSTAS tool, the SARC, and also the genitourinary actually, whether she is at, at risk with the symptoms and with the pH that you do. And then putting them all together, you know the risk status of different disorders. And then it very, very becomes very, very easy for one to manage them uh, uh, and to treat them and also give them the risk assessment for a particular disease. So it's not only for managing or for giving MHT. I think these tools become very, very important, the prediction tools, because that really warns these women that you need to be careful or you need treatment. So you're actually uncovering the latent disorders or you're kind of uncovering the diseases that they have, which they wouldn't probably would do. And then you start managing those diseases. And MHT, of course, becomes a small part of it, the decision making based on these tools. So I think the IMS has done a wonderful job in the last 25 years. And it is the ability. And I we don't call this as an organization. Actually, it's an IMS family. And uh, it is the uh, because I think all of us work together with a common vision. And that's how we are still sticking to the IMS, though we have been past, past, past uh, presidents. And most of us, like Jyoti and so many of us, are still around because we just enjoy being with the IMS family. Thank you so much.